right, so I'm going to have you open up with me to Romans chapter 3, verse 9 through 20. And the title of the message today is Guilty as Charged. So Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. And this is a number of verses that the Apostle Paul puts together, and he's making the final indictment that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He takes all of these passages you're going to read. There's actually 13 of them. Most of them come from Psalm 14, Isaiah 53, and Psalm 5, but there are a couple of them that come from some other passages. Here's the word of the Lord. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. What he's saying there, as a Jew, we're no better than the Gentiles. We've all sinned. As it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have altogether become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord God, and I pray, Lord God, today, the first step of salvation is to, Lord, come into the light and realize that one is a sinner and to confess one's sins to you, and then to put their faith in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, and Lord God, then the miracle of salvation happens. Guilt is wiped clean. They are instilled with the hope of eternal life. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell them. I pray, Lord God, if there is a soul in here, Lord God, who hasn't come to that place, that they would today. And help us all to understand, Lord God, how we can be more effective in witnessing and sharing our faith with others and lead others to you through this word today. And in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Key verse here, okay? Key verse. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged. I want you to notice that. He's saying we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. So... I'll ask you this question. He's saying we have previously charged this. Where did he charge this? Where, did, where was this charged in the book of Romans? And it's what we've been looking at for these last weeks. In Romans chapter 1, is, it talks about the sin of the Gentiles. And even though the Gentiles, us, okay, even though we don't have the law like the Jews do, God has written it on our hearts. He has given us a conscience. And again, there is the guilt, the awareness of sin. The second is the sin of the Jews in chapter 2. And again, they have been given the law. Not only do they have their conscience to convict them, but they have the Ten Commandments, the law of God, and the 613 laws of Moses to convict them. In chapter 3, what he's doing here, he's saying, all have sinned. Everyone. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, we've all sinned. We've all, we've all tasted of the fruit and sinned. We have resisted God, we have rejected God, we have rebelled against God, His will, His word, His way. And uh, if we're honest, and if we're not honest, I mean, if you did an x-ray of uh, uh, the human heart, <laughs> we talked about this last week, and you begin to look at the motives, the intentions, the thoughts, the, the anger, the jealousy, the bitterness, the greed, the enviousness, the selfishness, we would say that every human being is guilty. And we've all tasted of this guilt. And as human beings, we don't like the guilt. The guilt is the consequence of sin. And it's not something that we like to face. In fact, we try to eliminate it. We try to ignore it. We don't want to have to deal with it. Listen to what an unknown psychologist, I collect quotes, I don't even know who wrote this, but... Unknown psychologist, he wrote this, and I quote, One of the most painful, self-mutilating, time and energy consuming exercises in the human experience is guilt. It can ruin your day, or your week, or your life if you let it. It turns up like a bad penny when you do something dishonest, hurtful, tacky, selfish, or rotten. Never mind that it was the result of ignorance, stupidity, laziness, thoughtlessness, uh, weak flesh, or clay feet, 
you did wrong, and the guilt is killing you. Too bad. But be assured, the agony you feel is normal. Remember, guilt is a pollutant, and we don't need any more of it in the world. Now, destructiveness of it. American psychologist Hobart Mower, who wrote uh, the book, uh, The Crisis of Psychiatry and Reli Religion, he talks about what happens when we don't resolve our guilt. And he was a big proponent that Christian people have an opportunity to resolve their guilt like no other people on earth. And that if we leave the guilt unresolved, it causes physical illness, psychological disorders, uh, it causes an outbreak outwardly in our relationships to be damaged, and, and it affects every area of our life. He even goes so far to say that it causes psychosis in people who leave it unresolved. You think about, think about how people will try to deal with guilt. They, they will try to drink it away. Have you ever seen that? In 35 years of ministry, I've watched people try to drink guilt away. Or, or they will try to medicate it away with, with whether it's illegal drugs or, or illegal drugs. I believe much of the, the opiate uh, and, and marijuana you know, consumption in this country is people just trying to take the, 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 the pain away, get the edge off, just try to numb that, that, that gnawing guilt that they're dealing with all the time. Sadly, uh, some people, they try to get rid of the guilt through suicide. And you see that in the scriptures with who? With Judas. Other people, they, they will try to divert it. They try to divert the traffic, right? get away from it. They'll use entertainment. They'll use sports. They'll use games. They'll use some type of obsession. You think of all, all the obsessiveness, not only alcoholism, but how about sexaholism, rageaholism, uh, foodaholism, TVaholism. These are all the uh, 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 ideologyaholism, internetaholism, all these uh, obsessions. What drives it? I think people trying to escape from the, the guilt that again eats away at their souls. Seneca, the, the Roman philosopher, he said, every guilty person is his own hangman. Yeah, not only true of Judas, but true, true of many other people. So people, they try, they try to bury it, they try to medicate it, uh, they try to ignore it, but, but it stays there. And understand, guilt, guilt is a symptom of a greater problem. What's the greater problem? Sin. Right? The, the, guilt, the guilty conscience, the, the guilt that eats away at people is a symptom of, of sin, and it's evidence of sin. So, so in this passage, Paul, Paul is laying down an indictment. And, and it's a, a painful indictment. I've read through this passage hundreds and hundreds of times. You take this passage and put it, just put it and look at your life. Look through the lens of, of, these, you know, of these 12 verses, and, and it, it has a way of just kind of eating away really reveals the, 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 the darkness in our, you know, in our hearts. And uh, what he is doing here, essentially, is what a surgeon does. Now, I, just had, I just had major surgery a few months ago, and I tell you this, what he had to do, the surgeon had to cut through my skin, okay, a scar about that long, and then he had to cut through my muscles, and then he had to cut down deep, right, through the bursa, into the very joint, and then he had to start to cut. He cut bone, and he cut cartilage, all this damaged cartilage away. But he had to cut through all of that to remove, okay, to remove the damaged tissue. And I can tell you this, the week before I had surgery, I stood in this pulpit and I preached, three days before I had surgery, and there was no more of a painful time for me all week long and I, I could be working out, I, I could be in the gym on the treadmill, I could be on my bike, I could be doing all of that and not be in the amount of pain that I had standing here in the pulpit. I'll tell you this, just standing in the pulpit, I don't know if Maurice was saying, hey, you're moving around more. He's, Maurice is the, the one who does our TV program. And he's saying, you're moving around more because for, right, for about six months, I just stood here like this. And I, I'll tell you, my hip would be on fire. And when I was done here, I tell you something, I was worried I, would fall, I was falling down the stairs after I'd preach. After the surgery, two weeks later, I'm back in the pulpit. And all I can tell you is I'm standing here and I'm like, wow, this thing, this thing, there's no pain. I'm telling you, the night, the night of the surgery, I get up to go to the bathroom. And I'm standing there in the bathroom and all of a sudden I'm like, 
well, this is the first time in a couple of years I have no pain. But he had to cut through my skin and my muscles and, my, and, and all the connective. He had to cut through it all to get down to the root of the problem to be able to remove it. And, and that's what this passage is about. He's, he's cutting through to be able to remove the very, the very sickness, the very disease inside of us so that, that that guilt could be removed and that we could be free. So there's an indictment and the judge says here, guilty as charged. So let's, let's look. I'm going to break this down. I'm going to break this down into eight sections. There's 13. So I'm going to group some of them together. The first thing is, we all have missed the mark. You've missed the mark. I've missed the mark. Moses missed the mark. Noah missed the mark. Joseph missed the mark. Abraham missed the mark. David missed the mark. The apostles missed the mark. The apostle Paul missed the mark. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. Billy Graham and Mother Teresa. St. Francis of Assisi have all missed the mark. It says here, as it is written... And this is basically, this is a, a, a term that you see in the scriptures as it was written, as it is written, and as it will be written. The idea is in, it's in the present tense. And it's speaking, and it's speaking to us today. As it is written, there is no one righteous, no not one. Every one of us, right, have missed the mark. Every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all the religion... All the laws, all the rituals, all the people trying to be, be moral, they've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Have you ever seen somebody who feels they've never sinned? I had a guy one time, I was visiting him up in the hospital, I looked at him and I started talking about sin. He goes, I've never sinned. I was like, you've never sinned? And then he started dropping F-bombs. Never sinned. And now, if, if we are in denial and saying that we've never sinned, okay, we're, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. We've been deceived. If we say we haven't, that, that we have been continuously hitting the mark and we're not missing the mark, we're in a place of self-deception. Hans Christian Andersen's uh, book and story, The Emperor's New Clothes, was a, it made a major impression on me when I was a child. And, and it's about a king, and he wants a new set of clothes, and he gets talked into basically walking down the street, you know, I mean, he's got his underwear on, but he's naked. And this is his whole new set of clothes. He's like prancing down the street saying, look at me. And all the people, all his subjects are afraid to say, hey, king, you're naked. Except for this little kid who finally looks and says, the king is naked. But a lot of people are walking around naked. And they don't realize they're naked. And that's not only outside, that's in the church. To the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3 verse 17, Jesus says, because you say I am rich, do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? You're, 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 you're in total deception. You say you're rich, you say you're wealthy, you say you need nothing. And he says you're, you're, you don't realize that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I want to tell you something. I've been doing coaching with people. I've been doing, for the most part, business coaching, though I've done a lot of athletic coaching too. I think one of the biggest problems with people is they think they're far better than they are. I'm amazed at people who, like, they, they, I mean, they, they are, they are, their performance is so poor and I'm not talking about their potential here because I believe people have great God-given potential. But their performance is so poor and they'll stand there and they, they, they think that they're so much better than they are. And they're just not taking a realistic... And you can't, you can't get better until you start to get a good self-estimation of where you are. So when you think you're far better, you're not going to deal with the issues that are going on in your life. You're not going to look to inform, you know, improve your performance. And you're not going to improve... But a lot of people are walking around with a new set of clothes. And they don't realize that they're naked. And that they're essentially, they're missing the mark. The word for sin, and there's eight words used for sin in the, uh, in the New Testament. The word here is hamartia, and what it means is just that, to miss the target. We're missing the target. Now, now what target? What mark 
are we missing? Here's, here's, here's just one, one general example. And you tell me how you're doing. Be holy, for I am holy. Is there anyone here who has achieved that in their life? Anyone here who's living up to the purity, to the, to the holiness, to the goodness, to the righteousness of God? Because if you are, I want to drink what you're drinking, I want to smoke what you're smoking. Look at Paul. Paul wrote one-third of the New Testament, and he brought the gospel to the world. He, he is the, one of the most driven, tough... I mean, he's, he's, he's a force for God. No one ever like him. I, I don't think you'll find anyone greater in the New Testament covenant outside of Jesus, of course. Look what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 18 through 20. For he says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh... Now, he's talking about the body. He's talking about the lower nature... He says, nothing good dwells, for uh, to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, I just want to, have you ever had that experience? You know the good, but you don't do it. Has anybody ever done that? Am I the only one? And you know the evil and you actually do it. Now some people say Paul is talking here before he met Christ. And there could be a truth to that. Because I know I do this a lot less since I've come to Jesus. I used to do it obviously a lot more before. But it's still, I still have had this experience in my life. I know the good. And, and you know, I, I got the, the, the bow and arrow in my and I and I'm missing the target. I know the bad. And I'm hitting the target. So we've all missed the mark. Number two, no one understands, no one seeks God. So first, we've all missed the mark. Secondly, no one understands, no one seeks God. Verse 11, there is none who understands, there is none who seek after God. And he's quoting here from Psalm 14, verse 2, and uh, then from Psalm 53, verse 3. And He's saying here, no one understands. The idea here is, uh, the person without the Lord, their mind is empty concerning God, concerning His Word, concerning His will, concerning His Son. Their, their mind is void. It's a vacuum. And I can tell you this, that, that, that was true of me. But, but why, why is the unbeliever's mind just totally void of God? And, and the Word of God gives us an answer. 1 Corinthians 2.14 But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Before I was a Christian, the, the Bible, uh, the Word, uh, Jesus, church, was just foolishness to me. I, you know, you just, just the people that were into that around me I thought they were a little nutty, kooky, a little, a little weird. And I want to tell you something. God put some people in my life, you know, there are Christians who are weird. I'm telling you, there, I mean, there are some Christians who are just so weird, they just weird everybody out. Now, I have no idea how to, con how to connect with an unbeliever. They just, weird, they just weird you out all the time. I mean, some, some Christians, they, they go... Yeah, like, it's like they're high on something. But they, they would make me feel uncomfortable. So you talk about spiritual things, they'd make me feel uncomfortable. And you could talk to me about sports, you could talk to me about politics, you could talk to me about economics, you could talk to me about anything, I'd feel comfortable, and then they'd just bring up Jesus, and I'd feel weird. I'd feel uncomfortable. Why? Because I didn't have the Spirit of God. Now what, is it, what does it say in Romans chapter 8, verse 5? For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. That's where my mind was set. It, it was set on the things of the flesh, on my life, on my goals, on my objectives, on, on my success, on my pleasure. I had no interest in seeking God, no, no, no interest in God, no interest in searching the Scriptures. I was spiritually dead. So there was, I was empty of anything, anything of God in there. 
what does it take? It, it takes a breakthrough. It tells us in John chapter 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. I'm going to give you a very big theological word that will help you to understand the Scriptures. It's called prevenient grace. And prevenient grace is grace that goes before our salvation. If God does not initiate our salvation, no one can be saved. I believe, I believe, prevenient grace are those times where God is working and suddenly as an unbeliever, you, you have this awareness of God. You have an awareness of your sin. You have an awareness of, of Jesus as the Savior and you have that moment. Now, you can resist that. But God is the initiator. Prevenient grace doesn't mean a person is going to instantly be saved. They still, still have a free will to resist. But God is the initiator. I tell, people, I tell people this all the time. You know, people, well, well, I found God. Let me tell you something. I didn't find God. God found me. God found me when, when I, I didn't even know I was lost. He found me when I wasn't looking for Him. I wasn't going to church. I, 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 wasn't, seek, I wasn't seeking God reading the Bible. And all of a sudden, He, just, he, he came into my life and He gave me that, that moment. And I surrendered to Him in that moment. But, but without that, there's no interest in God. Number three, unprofitable. Romans 3.12, it says, They have all turned aside, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. The word there, they have all turned aside, is the concept they, they have lost their way. They're, they're, they're lost. They're, they're, they're wandering Look, look at the human race. You talk to people outside of Christ. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they've come from. They, they don't know where they're going. They don't know who's up there. You, you start asking them questions about, about the afterlife. You, you, they, they, have, they have no idea. And then it says, not only are they lost, but they're unprofitable. And the word here is a harsh word. The word is useless. In fact, it, the, the word... Basically, it's a term used for something that's rotten, sour. If you opened up a can of beans and it looked like that, what would you do with it? You're going to throw it in the trash. That's the idea here. That, that the person without the Lord is, is used. And you look at that and you say, boy, that's really harsh that God would say that because He loves human beings. Let me read, read to you this verse. It makes sense here. John chapter 15, 5. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. He says, for without me, you can do nothing. And when I read that, I was like, Lord. Lord, I, I, I had built a business before. I, 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 had, I had become a successful athlete before. Uh, Lord, I, you, you, would, I, you weren't in my life. And he says, but without me, you can do nothing. And I could see the CEO of the company saying, I became the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I could see the teacher saying, I, I became a professor at the big university. I could see the athlete saying, I was on a Super Bowl football team. What does he mean here, without me you can do nothing? Yeah, w without me, there's nothing you can do without Jesus that is going to contribute to the kingdom of God and is going to go with you into the next life. You can't lead people to Christ without Him. You can't make disciples without Him. You can't build the kingdom of God. C.T. Studd's poem. That's a great name, C.T. Studd, right? I was thinking of changing my name. F.B. Studd. <laughs> Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So you, you could have all those athletic, you know, I, you know just, I just threw out a bunch of my trophies. I kept a few. Maybe I'll try to take them into heaven with me. My 501K. All my degrees. They're meaningless. They're not going with me. They're not going with me. And, and it's what I've done for him with, the, with, the, with a pure heart and the right intentions and motives, that's what's going with me into the next life. Everything else, everything else is, is, is basically, I'm leaving it behind. 
So you have this, 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 this indictment is strong. I want, you, I want you to think of this. If you're at a university, let's say you, you could be at uh, Paramus, uh, Bergen Community College or Ramapo College or FDU or Columbia University in the area, and you're in an anthropology class, the study of humanity, and you would hear from the professor how wonderful man is, how, how noble man is, and how he has ascended through the chains of evolution to reach the apex of, of this being this modern masterpiece. But that's what you, that's what you get from the secular humanists. Even though he's created enough weapons to destroy the earth 50 times over at this time, even though in the previous century there were over 100 million of our fellow men who were murdered in genocides and wars and revolutions, even though of all of that, but you see, that's the human side. It's basically a denial. The biblical side is, and here's biblical anthropology, man is bad. Man is ignorant. Man is rebellious. Man is wayward. Man is useless without God. Without God. Fourth is his mouth, mouths that spew poison. Romans uh, 3.13, their throat is an open tomb, with their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Death, deceit. Right, stop and ask yourself the question, is your mouth an open grave? You know what that means, a mouth that is an open grave? The speaking of gossip and slander. You ever notice gossip and slander? There's a number of these uh, sin clusters where sin is described in Galatians 5 and in, in, in 1 Corinthians 5 where you, you see these sin clusters and you'll notice that gossip and slander is put right in there with murder because it's basically murder of the person's soul. Gossip and slander destroy the person's life and character. But that's what he's saying. Our mouths that are, that, are, that are open graves. Look at our political situation in this country. Look at the media. How, how they can just destroy a person's character with lies. With, with, with gossip and slander. Tongues that, that practice deceit. I don't know how many of you are students of history of World War II, but this is Joseph Goebbels. Joseph Goebbels is probably the greatest deceiver of the previous century. I actually think a greater deceiver than Adolf Hitler because he was Hitler's propaganda minister. I believe he was demon-possessed, as, as the Nazis were. But he said this, they ought to stop lying. He's talking about the Jews here. One day our patience will come to an end, then we will grab these insolence by their throats and shut their lying mouths shut. He's the one who brought forth all the propaganda that the Jews were the cause of every problem, every illness, every bit of suffering in the world. He also said this, and this really applies to the age that we live in, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. By the way, if you look at the major media outlets, that's exactly what they do. They just keep telling the same lie over and over and over. And then the, the, the ignorant, foolish, undiscerning masses just buy into it. And you talk to people. And they'll, just, they'll give you the talking points of these, of these pundits. And just receiving it without ever looking into it or thinking about it. My, my teacher, Chuck Messler, he talks about NASA. And he says, he says, every department in the United States government lies. But he said, NASA lies all the time. Let me show you something very revealing about NASA. At the end of World War II, the United States, under what was called Operation Paperclip, they basically took 1,600 Nazi scientists, brought them to NASA, and they were basically the, 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 the brain children behind the space program and a lot of the other programs. 1,600. Many of, them, many of them could have been put to death at Nuremberg, but we brought them. By the way, the, the, the Soviets got the technology and we got the scientists. But that, that is the, essentially the foundation of NASA over the course of the last 70 years. They were, they, were, they were Nazi scientists. Think about that. 
I mean, maybe they brought the technology with them. What else did they bring with them? Their moral natures? How, how about the, the political realm? The lies that come at us. I mean, have you seen this week? Oh, by the way, I, 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 I like President Trump's agenda. It's very pro-Christian. I hope you understand that. President Trump has a very pro-Christian agenda. That's why the Christian churches, for the most part, have been out supporting him. But, but he, he does lie. And he gets caught in his lies. I want to just tell you, President Trump, if you're watching this program today, stop lying. <laughs> just stop lying. You don't need to. Just speak the truth. Uh, Pelosi and Schumer, it's, it's just one lie after another. How, how about people in, in sales and marketing? You ever see the exaggerations and the lies of products that people are trying to market to you in the media over and over again? Done coaching with marketers and salespeople. How many times I just say to them, don't lie, don't overpromise, and don't exaggerate. You don't have to. You don't need to lie. I'm amazed that Christian people who are marketers and salespeople, they lie all the time. Now, I want to be fair with this. What about preaching and the preacher's lies? They lie to raise money, they lie to manipulate people, they lie to control people. I want to see, this week, I read this. A Roman Catholic priest from Pennsylvania who raped this boy over and over again. And after he would rape him, he would have the boy confess his sins to him. Now you talk about a person believing the lie? You talk about a person who's self-deceived? I was just, I was just, but he's in jail, good, he's in jail. He didn't get away, he didn't fall through the cracks and be hidden by the Roman Catholic Church. That to me is more appalling than the very crimes that have been done, that they covered it up. I've said that through the years, that if one of my pastors touched a child, the police wouldn't have to worry about me bringing him to the police station. They would have to worry about me bringing him in a body bag to the police station. Dante, get me in chains right away when you hear that happen. Get me in chains, guys. Lock me up. Put me down in a dungeon in the basement. Leave me there for a year because if I catch the guy, I'm going to strangle him. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, you can't separate the heart from your mouth. I can't separate my heart from my mouth. The things that are coming out of my mouth are, are the very words, okay, that describe what's inside my heart. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned. They reveal the true you. And most people don't like that, right? But the things that are coming out of our mouths reveal what, what's really inside of us. He describes lips as being poisonous lips, the lips, uh, lips of asp, and that's uh, essentially a, a snake. Our lips, again, they can kill. They, they can, I mean, you've been around people, when you hear them talk, they just make you sick. They can actually make you feel ill by the things that they're saying. I want to tell you something. I encourage you with this. Because we're supposed to be compassionate, right? Empathetic, loving Christians when you're around people like that. Listen, don't walk away from them. Run. 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 Romans chapter 3.14 says, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Have you ever had this experience? Look at this experience from James chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. But no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men. Have you ever done that? Guilty. 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 With the very tongue that I preach the word, I preach the eloquent words of the Lord, the oracles of God, I can curse somebody who've been made in the similitude of God, the image of God, and out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Number five. Swift to shed blood. In verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. Let me just let me read this to you about, if you look, at, you look at human history, human history is a history of bloodshed. 
But um, I came across this, and I was amazed at this. In 1643 and 1648, uh, a bandit leader named Chang Hsien Chung, according to Chinese history, it's estimated that he killed 40 million people. That's, that's, that, that's, that's amazing. 40 million. I've never even heard of the guy. I started reading up on him. Major genocides in the 20th century. I mean, you look at, look at these numbers, we think of the Holocaust, you know, six, six million Jews, the Ukrainian famine, the, the, the Ukrainians were starved by Stalin, seven million, some people estimate it could be as high as 25 million. The genocide of Cambodia, uh, two million. Again, some people estimate it's higher. On, on and on and on you can go. Have, have you ever heard of the destruction of the Jewish community in Jedwanby? In Poland, anybody hear about that? 1940. Anybody ever? Ever? Anybody in here? Let me just tell you about this. This is interesting. Six thousand Jews were murdered, not not by the Nazis, but by their Polish neighbors. Six thousand, a little community, and the Jews, six thousand of them, were killed by their next door neighbors, and put uh, put to death. And it was essentially it was incited by the propaganda of the Nazis. And the Nazis, you know, the Nazis just, you know, again, this is Goebbels, constantly putting out the information that, that Jews are the cause of all your problems. Jews are the, they, they've caused your physical problems because they passed on diseases. They cause your economic problems because they control all the money. It's like Louis Farrakhan today. Ever listen to Louis Farrakhan? The Jews, blame the Jews for everything. And the devil, like, working right through trying to destroy the Jewish people. Well, well they bought into it and they murdered 6,000 of their fellow neighbors. And, and these were people that, that, that you know, the, think of your neighbors. I want to tell you, the, the, the psychologist who, who, wrote, who wrote this book, Jan Gross, she wrote it in uh, 2001, she, she made a point that very nice people, very nice people can do very bad things when, when they are not grounded in, in, a, in, a, in a very principle-centered moral nature, and they buy into propaganda. I'm going to show you something that concerns me in America right now. See these groups? You have Antifa, you have neo-Nazis, you have the five percenters. They basically, they, 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 they look like they're against each other. I just want you to understand, they're, they're both leftist groups. I hope you understand that. People, people think the neo-Nazis are a right, I always see the left, uh, the left pundits on, uh, on, on TV saying, they think that the neo-Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan is a right group. They're not, they're a left group. They're all left groups. So well, left groups would fight with each other, of course. The, the, the communists of Russia were a right group, and the Nazis of Germany, basically it's national socialism, they're two left groups that went, out, that went to war with each other. But essentially what you have is the right, the left believes in government control. They believe the government should be bigger and bigger and bigger and control people. Socialism, communism. The, the right has believed that, you know what, government should be small. And that God gives us our national rights, not the government. And we're free. We're free. But th these groups are right now, are, are growing very rapidly in the United States, and I'll tell you something, they are opposed to, to Christians. We are part of the, you know, the, the, their enemy. And they're no different. I want to tell you something. Antifa is no different than Hitler and Mussolini and the brown shirts. But this is scary because this is growing very fast in this country. And you may see them fighting on the streets of uh, South Carolina or Oregon. It could very soon come to a church like ours. And this concerns me. Listen, I, I, I'm not going to be here much longer. I'm not going to be here on earth much longer. But I look at my kids and my grandkids, and it really concerns me. As Christians, is this, is this what they're going to have to be dealing with? I, I think that we need to be praying and we need to be very serious because I believe that, that America could be the next place of great bloodshed in this world. For the most part, the church is just asleep. Many of you are asleep. If you weren't asleep, I'll tell you something, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be here praying a lot more. And you'd be on your knees praying a lot more. You're asleep. But God needs to wake you up. He needs to wake up the church in this country. 
Number six, destruction and misery. Verse 16, destruction and misery are in their ways. And it's kind of, again, the pattern of, of mankind and what he leaves. And like, we, we immediately think, destruction of the environment, and that's true. How about, how about again, a previous century of, of just the destruction of 100 million people who were murdered in genocides, ethnic cleansings? How about what Len was just talking about before? How about abortion? You know what, globally, how many abortions? Lenny talks about like 60, 60 million abortions in the United States. There are 40 to 50 million abortions in the world per year. That's 125,000 per day. And you meet, you meet a lot of nice people, right? I mean, a nice, nice people who say they're pro-choice, right? You ever meet people like that? They're, they're, they're just not family members. They're, not, they're nice people who are, who are pro-choice. Most of the Democratic Party is pro-choice. Some Republicans are pro-choice. Holly, the whole Hollywood crowd is, is pro-choice. That's, that's the major thing that makes me up my decision on who I vote for. I will never, ever, ever vote for a candidate who is a, uh, who's pro-death. I will never, I don't care who it is, I will, if there are two candidates running, running side by side, and I just, I, it was a decision I just made in, a, in the previous election, they're both pro-death. I, I could not possibly stand before God and say that I voted for a person like that. That is, that is the ultimate decision because I believe that, that every human being and from the time of conception, God impresses upon that baby the image of God. The image of God. And if you've had an abortion, I'm not here to speak words of condemnation to you. Seek God for his grace. And I know that there's probably a lot of healing that you need. But I just say this to you, boy, it's, it's just a world where they're, they're murdering 40 to 50 million babies a year. And again, it's, it's, so, it's so sterile. You notice that? It's so sterile. It's a, it's a, it's a woman's choice. Don't you, don't you mess with my body. Don't you mess with my body. I'm, listen, I'm, I, I don't give a damn about your body. I don't care what you do with it. But that little baby in your womb. Hey, is there anybody here who wishes that their mother aborted them? Anybody? Have you ever met anyone and looked at them and said, well, you know what, just, uh, yeah, I wish my mother aborted me. I've never met a person like that. Let me just tell you something. Something convicting to us Many of us in the church, or many people in the church, are wallflowers. You know, called wallflowers. You go to a dance, you see the wallflowers. They don't get on the dance floor and dance. Or they're the spectators at the sporting event. They sit up in the field. They don't have a clue what it is to get down on the field and play the game. Many Christians are just there. They're in the stands. They're against the walls. And, and look, I, I don't think it's necessary to be carrying around a sign that you're pro-life. But God will give you multiple opportunities as you go through the year to speak out for life. And listen to what the Word of God says in Proverbs chapter 24, 11 through 12. Deliver those who are drawn towards death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we do not know this, does not he who weighs the heart consider it? He who keeps your soul does he not know it? And he will not render to each man according to his deeds. God is saying that when you see somebody who's being taken, we need to speak out. And we need to speak out in the church. And I know this isn't a popular message. This is one of those messages that they tell us, if you're going to grow the church, you don't talk about abortion. You don't talk because there's women that have had abortions and you're going to offend them. And there, there are women in the church who are pro-choice and you're going to offend them and you're going to lose people in the church because you need to, you need to get those, those giving units up, right? You need, you need to raise and fill up the seats. So it's not popular to do this. As it was not popular when Hitler was taking power in Germany and the majority of pastors and priests would not speak out against the Nazis. And I wonder if they had... I wonder if the pulpits were alive with people filled with the Spirit and fire like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Lutheran pastor, who Henrik Himmler, Hitler's right-hand man, put to death at Auschwitz. I wonder if the pulpits were alive, but the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church were silent. And I wonder, I wonder, 
but we are responsible to speak out. Here's another, another, another sign of, of, again, death in our culture. Infanticide. There have been 63, uh, 63 million Indian female children who have been killed with infanticide in India. And China, the numbers may be far higher. They say as much as 100 million. And infanticide is, is just this. In an agricultural society, it's not popular to have a girl. You want to have boys. So when the girl is born, they basically just bring them out into the woods and leave them there to die. Let the elements kill them or let the animals kill them. I'll tell you, tell you just a, a, a great little story. Frank, Frankie Schaefer told me this years ago. He said, in, in Rome, the practice of infanticide was, was rampant. And what they would do is, in the city, they would take the, the children that they didn't want, and they would put them on this ledge over the river. And it was about a 20-foot ledge. And then what happens is, it, you know, they just leave the kid there and they leave, so they wouldn't have to watch the kid fall in the water and die. But they leave the kid there, and then the kids would, would, would crawl, go off the cliff, down you know, the ledge, and they would go into the water and die. So the Christians had an Operation Rescue. They would come to them in boats, and then they would scale the walls, and they would save the children and take the children in and care for them. Well, well when the Roman authorities heard that, they put soldiers with spears on the wall, and they started, they started to kill the Christians when they were coming to save the babies. But again, this is, just, this is again the, the, the history of man with bloodshed. How, how about slavery? Say, oh, now, you know, we're in a new time. There's no slaves. You know, there are more slaves in the world now than there were before 19, uh, 1865, before the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. And you, you look, this is a, a study that was done, this is just from last year, 35.8 million slaves in the world. And you see the locations in the, in the red and the yellow. How about types of human trafficking? Sex trafficking, uh, labor trafficking, and organ trafficking. And this is rampant in our, in, our, in our world. Let me go to number seven, war. It tells us in verse 17, and the way of peace they have not known. I want to show you something to it that, that's very relative to my life. Look at this statistic. America has been at war 93% of the time, 224 out of 241 years since 1776. Doesn't that just shock you? And I started to investigate this and look at it just in my lifetime. There's just one period in my lifetime between the late 1970 and 1980 where we were not in some type of conflict or war. And most of you, you know, you relate, to, you relate to Afghanistan, you relate to Iraq. How many of you remember Grenada? Right? Some of you remember Vietnam. How many remember the conflict in Haiti? Or, or a revolution in the Dominican Republic? Panama? Right? Uh, 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 Slo uh, Slovakia? I mean, you, see, you, you can go on and on. The Sudan, Somalia, the Gulf War. But just a, just a few years out of my life where there has not been a conflict in just the United States. And this map shows 2016 Global Peace Index. Look at, look at again, in the red, uh, you, you see, uh, again, in, in the green, and the dark, just the, the conflicts that are going on in the world. Robert uh, Haldan, he wrote this. The most savage animals do not destroy so many of their own species to appease their hunger as man destroys his fellow man to satiate his ambition, his revenge, and his greed. By the way, I believe in just wars. But the wars that are started by people is usually, again, it's driven by ambition, by revenge, and greed. Another interesting thing is, is all the peace treaties that have been made. If you, if you study peace treaties through history, there's only 5% of all peace treaties that have ever held. I want to show you just, again, American history. Look at this. Over 50 treaties were made with American Indian tribes, primarily for land cessations. But 500 treaties were also broken, changed or nullified when it served the government's interest. And you wonder why the Indians are a little ticked off. Now we gave them, we gave them the right to have casinos, right? That's, that's the appeasement. Last one here. No fear of God. And this, this is, seems to be what the Holy Spirit here He's leaving this as the root cause 
again, of, of uh, the other things being symptoms. But this being the root cause, the, the, the deeper evil. He says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now look, look at what Proverbs says. Proverbs 16, 6. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. And sees the fear of the Lord seems to be, again, the driving force of people. And this, I, I, I think this is what it's talking about. It's not just talking about believers, but unbelievers as well. The idea that we are going to be held accountable, and we are being held accountable for our sins. I, I taught on the wrath of God when we were looking at, at Romans 1. And I, I had said this, that the wrath, there is a future wrath of God, hell, condemnation, the lake of fire. But there is a present wrath of God, and it is a principle that operates in every one of our lives. When we sin, we will reap the wrath of God in our life. When we sin, we will reap consequences for our sins. They, they will affect our bodies, they affect our minds, they affect our relationships, they affect our careers, they affect our, our pocketbook, they affect our children. But when we sin, there, there is this principle of wrath that works. And, you know, you can call it reaping and sowing, right? The, the Hindus call it karma. But look at, look at mankind. And a lot of people think, oh, I can just keep sinning here. You know, I see people like they're in an adulterous relationship. I can just keep sinning and sinning. I'm going to get away with it. You're not. You're not. And even if your spouse never finds out, let me tell you something. It's going to eat away at your soul. It's going to eat away at your body. It's going to eat away at your mind. It's going to just eat away. Look, look at the consequences, again, of the wrath of God. Just look at some of these people's lives. You got preachers there, you got athletes there, you got politicians there. I mean, Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby, like my favorite, my, my, my favorite guy. I never would have believed it. My brain still has a hard time registering. I grew up with Fat Albert. The Cosby Show with my kids watching it every Thursday night. Loved him. Loved his comedy. It's amazing you could do comedy for an hour and never drop an F-bomb. Make you laugh. The consequences of sin. These are, these are people, this, they were on top of the world. They, they were on top of the world. They were the elite of their careers. They had wealth. They had fame. They had power. And they all reaped the consequences of their sins. Likely thinking again with no fear of God. I'm just going to be able to get away with this. You think Bill Clinton? And everybody laughs. Right? He, and he, he was a president of the United States and everybody just, just laughs at, you know, at what he did. The Word of God tells us as believers, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And don't give up when he corrects you for the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he will discipline us. Why are there people in the church who just, who just I mean, who, who sometimes they, they do a, a, atrocious things. They, they directly violate the, the, the will of God. And I believe it's because they have no, they have no fear of God. They don't think they're going to get caught. They don't think they're going to have to pay the price. They don't think there's going to be any reckoning. And there is a reckoning. If you don't think God disciplines us, read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. 1 Corinthians 11, 30. Read about how we'll discipline you in your body. Not to mention your mind, not to mention your spirit, not to mention your career or your wallet. Many Christians in the church, well, I'm saved by grace. Do you realize that every one of us is going to have to appear before the Bema Seat of Christ? The judgment seat of Christ, every one of us will appear before it. It is not a judgment of condemnation. But when you appear before the judgment seat of Christ, you will be judged as to what you have done since you have taken Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior. And he's going to judge you as to what you have done with your time, with your money, and with the spiritual gifts and physical abilities that he's given you for the kingdom of God. Some people, it says, are going to receive great rewards. And it says other people are going to go into heaven... Basically, their butts are going to be smoldering, but they're going to be saved with no reward. If that shouldn't wake us up to a greater accountability and responsibility. 
And then you have the great white throne judgment of God. And this is for unbelievers. This is for people who have rejected the salvation of the Lord. They've rejected Jesus. They've, res they've resisted him. They've rejected him. They've rebelled against him. I don't need you, Jesus. I don't want you, Jesus. Again, what drives that? There's no fear of God. It it's a shame, but this culture we live in, people have no fear of God. They don't fear God in this life and they don't fear him in the next life. And you see the things that are being done with them believing that there is no, they, they will not be held accountable. They believe there are no consequences. And there are consequences. So you have the indictment. He, he brings this to a close in verse 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Notice this, though. Every mouth may be stopped. You ever present the gospel to someone and somebody starts, you know, just blah, 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 you know, they don't know what they're talking about, but blah, blah, blah. All it is is it's just a smoke screen to them to cover up their sin. Most of the arguments that you hear against the gospel are just simply, they're arguments that are a smoke screen for people to continue in their sin. That's why when you're sharing the gospel, realize that. They're not intellectual arguments. What you're getting is, you're getting blah, 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 I want to continue to smoke marijuana. Blah, 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 I want to continue to commit on morality. Blah, 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 I want to continue to cheat and steal. Blah, 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 I want to continue to gossip and slander people. Blah, 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 I just want to live my life. And it's all a smoke screen. But there will come a day when people will stand before God and every mouth will be stopped. And they'll be like, but God, blah, 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 blah. And God will say, hey, here, look at my TV screen. And on the screen, flashing before their eyes, every sinful word, every sinful action, every sinful thought. And all of a sudden, it will be zip. There's no response. So here's our, here's our final application. This, this entire first part of Romans it is, again, it, it, the Holy Spirit has finally orchestrated this through the, the pen of the Apostle Paul to bring people to the place where they admit that they're sinners. You can't come to Christ until you fess up and admit that you are a sinner. That, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the, the whole purpose of the first three chapters. To bring us to a place where we admit that we're sinners. Listen, a lot of times people sharing the gospel is like, well listen, come to Jesus and he's going to give you peace. And that's true. Come to Jesus and uh, he's going to give you joy. That, that's, that's true. Come to Jesus, he'll make you happy. Come, come to Jesus, he'll, he'll get rid of your, your bad breath. Come, come to Jesus and your farts won't smell anymore. Come, 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 to, come to Jesus and, and, and he's going to make you rich. And, and, and listen, to what, what, that's what you get with a lot of gospel preaching. And people make these decisions and they never get saved because they've come to him for the wrong reasons. And I think churches are filled with people like that. They've never come to Jesus because he saves you from your sins. He saves you from hell. He saves you from the penalty and the power of the sin in your life. That's why I need you. Now, there's a lot of other perks that come. But that's the main reason. For all have sinned, right, and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and what does that mean? The wages of sin is death. Not just physical death, folks. Spiritual death. Spiritual death is eternal separation from God. Forever and ever and ever. It's described as, as, as a lake of fire because it must be so terrible to be completely separated from God. People say, well, I'm, in this world, I'm not really interested in your God and I'm not, I'm not separate, you know, I'm separated from him now. No, you're not. No, you're not. 
Every unbeliever in this world, they still have the image of God in their life, in their soul. And, and God is still there and there. The, the joy, the happiness, the moments of peace that they experience are all gifts from God. And that's all ripped from them. Nothing God. That's spiritual death. So for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. I can't leave you there. Right? But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's where the rest of this book goes. Aren't you happy it's only three chapters about sin? Aren't you happy I'm not going to be preaching on this next week, but I'm going to just be, be saturating you with the grace of God next week. You think this is hard for you to sit through? Let me tell you, it's hard for me to live through for the last two weeks. And I start looking at myself under the lens. And I stand, I'll tell you, the only reason I stand, I stand by grace. Because, man, I, 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 I'm the holiest, right? I'm the holiest person in this room. I want to tell you, I'm holy. I'm the holiest man in this room. Maybe not as holy as all the women, but I got more holes in me than, let me tell you something, Swiss cheese. And I need a savior to plug them up. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when you confess your sins before him and believe in your heart that, that he is God, he is the savior, he is the Messiah, he is the Lord. And you put your faith in him that he hung on that cross for you six hours one Friday so that you would never have to experience condemnation. He took your hell upon him on that cross. When he cried out to the father and said, Father, right, he, he, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Lama, 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 sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou for, forsaken me? He took your hell upon him so that you would never have to suffer hell. And you put your faith in him, and you put your faith in who he is and what he's done, and you receive salvation. And let me tell you, all your sins are forgiven. And God don't look at you as a sinner anymore. He looks at you through His Son and what His Son has done. And I can tell you that was the best offer that was ever made to me in my life. When I understood that, I said, how could I refuse this? Because I knew my sins. And I'll tell you, He took away the guilt. He removed the guilt. And I still fall short and I still come to Him and confess my sins. And I'll just tell you this. With Jesus... Every day is a new beginning. Every day is a fresh start. Every day I have a clean slate because of what he's done for me. And I can live without that guilt eating away at me. And that is a wonderful, wonderful blessing. It brings health. It brings joy. It brings peace. If you haven't taken him into your life personally as your Lord and Savior, do so today. Because that is the most important decision and choice you'll ever make. Would you all bow your heads? We'll close in prayer.